Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Our text for this week, the first Sunday in Lent, fall on February 26, 2023. Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and then chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The psalm is Psalm 32. Uh, the epistle reading is Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 19, and our gospel lesson is Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, the familiar text that we read on this first Sunday in Lent. This is when Jesus hires the worst mission developer consultant ever. <laughs> well, it's well, clergy coach. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, just, you know, it's all good advice at one level, but it's, you know, but it's, there are all these things about how do you treat sustenance? How do you gather a crowd? What kind of power do you want to exercise? And we talk about these are all false visions of what it might mean to be son of God or false images of what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. But they're appealing. They, they, they all will yield a result that might be power, influence, fame, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. But they, of course, utterly miss, I almost said the ethos, that's too small. They almost miss the heart of what he's really about with the true nature of what this gospel is going to be. And so it's, it's like when people try to introduce false values into a church's structure for the sake of some kind of outcome. Mm -hmm. you're like, well, hasn't God already shown us what it's supposed to look like, you know, that it's supposed to be, and this, the, the kind of the nature of Jesus's response to the devil from, from Deuteronomy are no, 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 no. Like you've missed what's at the heart of the matter. So, you know, the dialogue isn't so much like temptation in, Ooh, wouldn't you love this lovely, you know, five layer chocolate cake or something like that. It's, it's way more insidious than that, yeah. mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, do you, will you settle for this substitute? That's going to look pretty much the same in the eyes of a whole lot of people, but inside is full of decay and you know, it's, or down the road. Well, it's, it's so yeah, because it's anyway, that's just the, the joke, right? It's the, the worst mission consultant developer ever, you know, it's somebody who like, who's got great ideas if this is what you want. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, it's not exactly what Jesus wants. Does that make sense? Or am I too like? Yeah, no, no, I love it. And insidious is a insidious is the right word. Um, I, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is I don't want it to look like this kind of the you know the hero versus the obvious villain mm -hmm. that really the temptations are really close to home. Yeah, the tests are really they're dressed up just pretty nicely. Well, and I think that's where we kind we recognize where this story lands after Jesus' baptism, and then before it. To what extent we note or we go forward a little bit to four seventeen that this experience then leads to the capacity for Jesus to be able to say, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near." And so that we don't look at these, this experience as some sort of um, performative or, uh, or even a test or temptation. I know it says test and temptation, but that it's also a, I, I, I talked about this in a, in a workshop that I did a couple of weeks ago, that uh, Jesus own sort of sense of understanding his relationship with God and what that's going to mean and his trust in God and how that then will be embodied and manifested in his own ministry. So for example, the bread, the, the, the command these stones to become loaves of bread, uh, because he's, you know, famished. And yet, uh, we look forward in the gospel and you get in chapter six that, you know, you should not worry about anything because God will provide and Jesus himself will provide bread uh, in chapter 14 of the feeding of the 5,000. And then, of course, at the very end of the story, the devil left him and suddenly angels came and served him, uh, diaconia. And so 
it's it's how is it that this passage is Jesus' own working out of his identity and uh, and his belonging to God, which was affirmed at his baptism. Uh, but now, what what does that belonging to God going to mean? Uh, and and that kind of loyalty and obedience uh, to this to this mission, and uh, and and what is it that what is it that that sense of righteousness or justice is going to be then integral to who he is and how he is. So that we don't see this as, um, and that we also, I think, you know, the other thing is that the sermons that just fall so flat when like Jesus was tempted, like we are, well, this is, this is not the same thing. It's just, you know, and it's not like, uh, as you said, it's not like a a five layer piece of chocolate cake, right? It's, that's not what's going on here. It's really a, it's really a moment for Jesus to, yeah, to, to think about what does it mean to, for, to be the son of God, to belong to God and to be obedient to that, to that reality and that identity. And that's, so if the preacher can get at the side of the that mm, poignancy of it and that deep that deep sense of of wrestling, maybe I think that would be key. It's a big picture agenda, um, you know. So that the, the whether or not I, I'm tempted to take that chocolate cake, especially during the season of Lent when <laughs> processed sugars is one of the things that I try to say goodbye to. Don't remind me. Thank you very much for that, Matt. But um, but uh, it's it it's that's an individual kind of focus, and um, and here I I like the pairing of the lectionary with uh, the Genesis. A temptation story because again when we think about this individually we forget that what it means to be human is to bear the image of God in flesh which is exactly what Jesus is you know the word made flesh the word that was God is God was with, with God um, now walks among us in tabernacles oh Geez, Caroline, I went to John. Look what you do to me. Um, but yeah, one more week, and then we can get to you. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. But um, but this idea of what it means for us to keep this big uh, mission before us that you mentioned, uh, Matt, that this is about what the kingdom of God is like. That Matthew will have Jesus talk about, and that's the mission. The mission is not. Uh, uplifting the individual person of Jesus. It's not, how do I accomplish this goal now that it's been confirmed that I'm doing what God wants me to do? Um, It's an echo for those who have a memory of uh, the first and second chapters of Judges, where uh, the the Spirit of God is is with uh, Israel as they are entering into the land of Canaan, and with those victories, they stop depending on God and start making deals with the people. And it's a subtle shift. And that's what happens in, in, in Genesis 3. It, it's the idea, the planting of the idea. God's holding out on you. What more can you have mm-hmm. than everything? Mm-hmm. And Adam and Eve are like, yeah, this does look good. Well, of course it looks good. God made it. Mm. It's got to look good. But is this going to deviate from that larger mission of the reign of God on earth? Or is this going to put you in the seat of power, which is what the temptation was? You can be like gods. Yeah. And yes, I've, I've shifted from Matthew to Genesis. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, we're doing both. I yeah. think. And I, and I, that also makes me think too, of what you said about, about what you're going to give up for Lent, you know, the, the, the processed sugar. Uh, I haven't figured out what my thing is going to be, although often I don't. And I wrote an article about this was a long time ago, but, but thinking about, 
yeah, that that sense of giving up something. But really, this is this this is Jesus leaning into who He is, yes. right? And and uh, and what what does that then mean for His life? That this identity and his and his ministry and so i think it gives a little bit perspective a little bit different perspective on the whole season of lent in general that we don't walk around giving up stuff but that we how is it that we what kind of practice or what kind of perspective given you know given matthew do we lean into or take on that wow. that deepens our identity as children of oh. god yeah, and that's what maybe that's good thinking. stuff, Caroline. Oh, wow. Well, thanks. Yeah, the connecting of the two passages is useful to me uh, as we're talking about it. The uh, one of the challenges is taking both of these texts out of their kind of mythical framework so that these aren't just archetype mm -hmm. temptations, mm -hmm. because I don't mm -hmm. often experience my own moral reckonings in my head in that archetypal way, right? It's a series of small decisions and things like that. And so mm -hmm. how do we take these kind of almost, when I say comical, I don't mean silly, but I mean, um, but you know, it's really easy to tell who's good, who's bad, what's wisdom and what's, what's falsehood mm -hmm. and, and make them more realistic to us. Because here's the thing, these are the kinds of temptations people in the church face every day and us in in leadership positions and the people who are watching and listening mm -hmm. are people in leadership positions who all want to change the world mm -hmm. all want to have an influence and an impact mm -hmm. and these are the same kinds of temptations we face in some ways our congregations face them some of our members and congregations of course as well um mm -hmm. the lust for power in particular that that third one that jesus encounters Mm -hmm. right. How will you, how, how will you change the world? How will you exercise influence? And it's seductive. And without getting political, we, there are churches, there are people under the Christian banner who are seeking out power, people in all different kinds of places with different kinds of motives, not just to single out that one thing, but it just shows the way in which we're so enticed by certain shortcuts, I guess, is the best way uh, to put it, that take us around, mm -hmm. go back to the language of simplicity, the rather simplistic eth ethics of the kingdom of, of self-giving love. And mm -hmm. yeah, we could keep going. But as Joy would said recently, I'll, I'll start preaching soon if, if I don't stop. Well, I think, I think that that's helpful. Also, another angle is that that yeah, where is it that we are com we are tempted to in take these shortcuts that that result in an uh, in a more immediate reality or wish? And I think about that as you said, Matt, with our leaders out there, who you know, if you do this, then you'll have you know you'll have more people come. You thought this, you know, this is that easy equation of do this than this. And really what the temptation is about and, and the Genesis, it's about relationship and relationship mm -hmm. is not an easy fix. It is an ongoing commitment <laughs> that you recognize your identity, that you, that you affirm your identity and, and to whom do you belong? And that is a way of living. It's not, it's not a means to an end. And uh, so I think that I was thinking about this passage a lot with uh, with my dad, and uh, and I know I talked about him quite a bit, but that uh, that sense of identity of belonging to him as his daughter was a way of living. It's not it's not performative or perfunctory, and I think that's really at the heart of these passages. It's it's about identity and relationship with God that you are that you are committing to, and it's not it, like I said already. It's not a means to an end. It's not for a particular mm -hmm. result, uh, and that's kind of what the devil's. That's like that's the. Yeah, that's the trick of the devil, right? Like this is mm -hmm. this is a mean. This you will get this if you do this, and that's not how relationships work.
And that, that circles back to how you began us, Matt, is, is the simplicity or shortcut to the end. I want to lift up a quote uh, by Oswald Chambers. I, I reference this one a lot. Um, I don't know if I've ever thought about it uh, until uh, today in relationship to, to these passages. Um, but uh, this is what Chambers says. Uh, and uh, Caroline, as you were saying, this is the temptation um, uh, looking to the result. If we preach the effects of redemption in human life, instead of the revelation regarding Jesus, the result in those who listen is not new birth, but refined spiritual culture. We have to see that we are in such living sympathy with God that as we proclaim God's truth, God can create in souls the things which God alone can do. And uh, I, I thought about it as you might have picked up. Uh, what is the refined spiritual culture that seems to be the end that we're all looking for? And that's not it. Chambers is saying refined spiritual culture is not it. And, and when you seek the effects of redemption rather than what God alone does, and that's what Jesus is saying, I, I don't want the effect. I'm not looking for what you are promoting as the end, because what God is doing is deeper and more permanent and more, um, I was going to be repetitive and say more eternal, uh, but I, I guess, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's more substantive than you know, just something that flashes for numbers or for for power and privilege. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should we move on to this? Like, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> In case you were wondering. Yeah. yeah there's As a lot do of, I. There's a lot of theological bankruptcy out there, isn't there? Yes. Um, yes. Of, of ways in which church gets trapped into, mm -hmm. uh, into, as you said, the effects mm -hmm. that, uh, those quick fixes, those product, the, 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 uh, the temptation of productivity that, and you just dig a little bit, scratch a little bit at the surface and there is nothing underneath that. Nothing, no. nothing theologically at stake whatsoever. And that's well, it becomes. Hmm? Sorry, you. No, go ahead. Going. That it, it becomes all the more seductive too when the system is under stress. So I, Jesus yeah. is starved yeah. when this is taking place. Right, he's famished when this is going on. And however you want to define the state of the church, of course, it's different depending upon who and where we're talking about. But yeah, but when the system as a whole is under stress, it. No wonder, because then part of the seduction is that old stuff's not working anymore, mm -hmm. right? Or so the stuff that you thought was the heart of the gospel is not working anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, it's right after a great success. You know, so Jesus has been affirmed and named and, and uh, you know, that's when he goes out into the wilderness and so after this, 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 this uh, affirmation of co comes, you know, so after the success of whatever we thought success was, now we get this opportunity to, to heighten it, to get it more quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or he's and, terrified and, is the other possibility. <laughs> or he's terrified. Yes. There's so many different ways to, to get into this scene Right. That that can, again, what we talked about last week, you have to know your congregation um, and 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 speak to where they are. Um, not just, you know, not just this kind of. I can't finish that sentence, so somebody help me out of that. <laughs> well, this is kind of generic sense of. Generic. Yeah. Generic. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. If we look at the psalm here, um, uh, uh, this is a psalm that fits for me with the Genesis, um, the covering and uh, hiding iniquity. You can play with those kinds of words. If, 
It's what gets you out of the distress. What gets you out of the, I need to hide from God. What gets you out of the, um, um, oh, now I see things are not the way that they should be. And it, it turns us back into uh, what God has done, what God is doing. And that's the place of contentment. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I think the placement of this psalm in, in the service would really depend on what you do with the other text mm -hmm. if you're going to use it liturgically. And uh, if you're going to preach on it, um, I, I would really say preach on it in the context of what the other texts are talking about. And maybe that's just because I really appreciate the insight uh, that you guys have brought uh, as we've looked at Matthew. And I, I would not want a congregation to, min to miss that insight. And I believe that that can be pulled out of this psalm, um, but it would be putting the psalm back into a context where um, the result of happiness, the end product of happiness, the desire for happiness um, loses the true end of being in right relationship with God and recognizing what God alone is doing in the world because it is only God who can do these right things in the world. Yeah. Yeah, if, if the Genesis... I'm sorry, I missed that last line. That's all I got on the psalm. That's all you got in the psalm. <laughs> if, the, if the Genesis text is the big mythical archetype of where does sin come from and what is what are the origins of human fallenness, to use that, that term, the psalm here has to do with the emotions or the lived reality of brokenness, wherever that comes from, whatever that looks like. The notion, the idea of a body wasting away um, strength being dried up is in the heat of the summer. Mm -hmm. These, everybody knows what this feels like. Mm -hmm. And sometimes because of things that you, uh, you all plural have done wrong. I have done wrong. Sometimes it's because of things that have been done to us. Sometimes, you know, it's not always about my mistake, therefore my consequence, but it's the consequences of a broken world. And so, it, I mean, what a, a preacher doesn't have to talk people into what this feels like. Most people I imagine know these, these feelings. And like you said, well, what can God do about that? Which is where the Psalm tries to, to take us. What, what's interesting about this week is I think the Jesus story, I think the gospel story is, stands on its own in some ways. The other three texts really do allow us to probe that question of <laughs> what does sin do to us? I'm less interested in the question of where does sin come from. I'm more interested in the question of what does sin do to us. I don't want to solve the question, are we really born sinners or are we not? I'll let the theologians fight about that. But mm -hmm. but what are the lived realities and the lived suffering that result because of human sinfulness? And that's part where that's maybe a good segue to Romans. I was thinking Well yeah, that. Paul's gonna say it's because of Adam, but I think he means more than that too. But yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you want to say about Romans? Well, just I like that. That what are what are the results of sin, or what does sin lead to? And and you, uh, yeah, you see Paul uh, trying to wrestle with with that all, <laughs> you know, in part the origin, but uh, but it's the the way in which you get the language here of what you were just saying, like uh, that the consequences of sin or the the kinds of destructive behavior, but also like destructive thinking is really the result of sin or that the way in which sin gets manifested in our world. And so I, uh, so I think that's in part what you could get at with the, with the Romans text in the way in which you have uh, particularly around uh, that, around God's grace and you have grace, grace, free gift, grace, free gift, grace, right? And that, but that sin, the way in which sin prevents you from seeing that you can't, you can't imagine that you can't, uh, it, it's impossible for you to have that perspective. And so I, that's what I mean. It's, it's the way in which that it, it leads to, it leads to even the, ultimately the rejection of God's very own gift and and an inability to yeah an inability to see it accept it want it question it and so i think 
which makes then sin all the more uh, all the more problematic. <laughs> um, yeah. And and there's so much at stake. It's not just a sin. Is not just then one's morals or lack right. thereof. It is. Uh, there's way, way, way more going on than uh, than the things you might list. That okay, I did this and this and this. <laughs> the the impact, Matt, that you were suggesting that made this segue possible. The impact globally. The impact um, in 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 creation itself. The impact and uh, and its effect on communities is is really what is at stake not not just whether or not i cross the moral line but what does that do to my community what does that do to my neighborhood what does that do to um the world mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and paul would say death the, the it, it is. So the, the, the power of Paul's, again, archetypal notion of this is that sin and death have become these, these, these twin towers, like right? these two, these powers that are aligned with each other, mm -hmm. rampaging, uh, exercising <laughs> dominion, literally Basilua reigning uh, over the world. There's a poetry there that's, that's beautiful <laughs> as it is haunting. haunting. And again, you don't have to get into the, the question of, is really death a consequence for sin? Don't we understand death in multiple ways? Yeah, but it's this idea of how do you know when something is sinful, it's going to produce death in some way, shape, or form. And this is, preachers have the imagination to help people trace that. Not just to say, aha, I told you sin was dangerous, but to say, yeah, that thing that you feel, that death that you keep dying it's because of a world that's broken. Yes. And I think about, um, I think about whether it's a long-term suffering of death <clears throat> or a, a sudden shift, you know, so, you know, when the pandemic hit, folks uh, who died from COVID, it was quick and yet it wasn't immediate if, if that, timing makes sense for us. And so whether you're, whether we're looking at something that seems to affect us out of the blue, but has a lingering, uh, a, a lingering effect on us until it actually um, destroys us, uh, or if it's something that kind of creeps into our life, like dementia, and when you realize its effect fully, you've already been destroyed. And for a lot of people with like dementia, you know, once that dementia is fully taken over, it's not bad for them because they've forgotten. It's bad for their loved ones because they're looking at the person, they're hearing their voice, they're catching a few, few phrases and your mom doesn't know who you are. You know, and, and that's the, to use your word from a, a last week, Matt, that's the insidiousness of it. It is that this this archetype that that Paul is lifting up here, it whether it's immediate or whether it's a, a, a long time in coming, the destruction that it puts on us is cat catastrophic. And for that, we need the intrusion of the presence and peace of God. It, for that, we need God to do what God alone can do.